back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. This is the first video we are recording with a fancy new camera, so we shall see how this goes. It's evening, the lighting that we have is gaslight, so it looks like it's a little bit yellow toned, but that is just fine. Um, I welcome feedback and let us know how you think things are going with this channel. What I wanted to do today is to look at carving tools. This is going to be the first of a series of videos on wood carving, and I wanted to do this first in to start off the series, but also because in the last few days I've had multiple questions from friends about carving tools and what you need, what you don't, how to find things that are reasonable price, and it's very easy when you're getting into a new hobby, a new skill, to open up a book or to open up a catalog and get very overwhelmed and think that you need everything. <coughs> this is not my entire tool chest, but every type of tool that I do actually use in carving I have represented here on the table. You don't even need all of these to get started. You only need a couple. There's, um, right here at the beginning I'll say, the couple that I use pretty much on every carving are draw knife. I use this on maybe not every, but definitely most. These two small knives I definitely use on every carving. And a saw, some way to cut out your blank. Those are the four most fundamental tools. From there, you'll go out and you'll get things as you need them. So think about those four first. But I do want to go through the whole set, put them in context, and explain where and when I use all of these things. So first off, you have the need to cut out a blank. You don't want to take a tree and start whittling it. Very silly. So you need to take whatever stock you have and knock it down to a size that is reasonable to start your carving. I brought one saw out with me. I have a bunch of saws. I have several shells. My wife behind the camera is nodding her head at me. It's like, yeah, dude, you got too many saws. Um, I have a problem. So I have large numbers of shells in, in my, well, I have shells with large numbers of saws out in my workshop just waiting to be restored. This is an American or British pattern saw. This one is Distin out of Pennsylvania. It's a very good company. It's certainly not the only, the only saw you can use. But a back saw like this is a nice starter saw. You can go to a hardware store and you can get a reasonable saw like this for very little money. The new saws are usually come with impulse hardened teeth. If you look at the teeth, you can tell by looking whether it is one of these. If the saw plate is silvery but all of the teeth are blue right on the tips and they've been impulse hardened. Those are very hard. They hold their edge for a very long time, but they're not sharpenable, so they're disposable. You throw them out. So get, you can get one of those, you can use it. Um, if you, you only need really to get started one saw. This one is, it has a very fine tooth. There's two ways to file a saw tooth. One is with a chisel edge for ripping, which is cutting into the end grain. The other is with a knife edge, which is for cutting across the grain. A fine tooth saw, sharpened rip, will do both jobs well enough to get you started. So one recommendation for just getting started, go to the hardware store, buy an El Cheapo impulse hardened back saw. It will be sharpened, rip, you can use it for both. It will get you started, you can start getting the feel of the wood, the feel of your projects. Learn from that what else you want to do and then go buy another saw with purpose and with knowledge. That's the best way to do it. The second type of saw that's fairly common these days are Japanese saws with teeth on both edges of the blade. I don't have any of these, but they're very easy to find. You can find them online, you can find them on um, internet auctions, you can find them at hardware stores. But if you see one of those saws, usually they have, a, they have a, a handle with a fairly narrow neck and then it flares out and you have a wide saw plate with teeth on both edges of the wide saw plate. One edge will be sharpened rip, the other will be sharpened cross cut. That's another very good way to get started. 
I do have some Japanese tools, uh, but all of my saws are British or American pattern because they're what I can get cheap at yard sales from refurbished. So that's the first step. You want to take it and you want to get it into size. If you want to go hand tools, go this. You can also go power tools and go use or borrow the use of a bandsaw. I just cut this little guy out on a bandsaw. This will be a little Christmas goose, Christmas tree ornament. Bandsaws are very nice. Not everybody has them. You don't need a bandsaw. At some point here along the line, as part of this series, I will do a video just on cutting blanks out without a bandsaw. Most of my blanks, I don't use a bandsaw. We are off grid, so anytime I use the bandsaw, I have to haul out a generator and turn it on and have it running the whole time I'm using it. So when I have a whole bunch of stuff to do, I'll go out and use the bandsaw. When I just need to do one or two things, I use other methods. So you don't have to have a bandsaw. Next thing in terms of coarse removal of material is going to be the dryer. You can resize material faster with a saw than anything else. Knock a big board down to a small piece. The next most aggressive tool is the drum. This is a wonderful tool and you can put a crazy amount of wood on the floor very quickly with one of these. These duck bodies, this one is only partially formed. You can see what the finished pattern is. This is entirely shaped with this tool, as well as a much larger saw and some wedges. So when I'm making these, I make these out of scrap slabbing I get from sawmills. This is pine. So I'll get the slabbing, I'll trace the outline of the duck body, I'll put a wedge and hammer it down, split off one edge of the slabbing, drive a wedge down on the other, split off the other edge of the slabbing, and then the rest of this is bringing it down with the draw knife. And again, you can waste wood extremely quickly with this tool. Two-handed tool, you, you use it pulling it towards yourself. Now, I'm sure you've been told not to cut towards yourself, but there's a couple attributes of this which make this safe. The first is you keep your elbows in, and when you pull it towards yourself with your elbows in, this is about as far as you can get without running out of range of motion. Okay. Also, this one is narrow enough that my chest will stop it. This is as close as I can get it to my body. So it's a safe tool to use. I will sometimes, another tool I didn't bring up for this, I will sometimes go to town with a hatchet. This is much safer though. I do a lot more with this than with a hatchet. I use the hatchet when I have a, a piece that I cannot possibly get in the vise because you do have to immobilize your work in the vise to use this tool. If I can't use it in the vise, then I will get out a hatchet and do some chopping. But if I can get it in the vise, I will use this over a hatchet. It is faster and it is safer because this is as close as I can get it to my body. You can get wider ones. Now you can get it all the way in. The way to maintain safety with when using one of those is, like I said, keep your elbows in. Still, you run out of range of motion here if you keep your elbows in. Swing your elbows out. Well, now you can become like my half-brother. Don't do that. Okay, so this is my next tool. After I cut things to size with the saw, this is the next one. This handle was entirely shaped with that draw knife. This is not turned work. This is whittled with a draw knife. It's really the only tool that I used on here. Not even sandpaper or a file. This is a finished surface produced by the draw knife. So you can do fine work with this, and you can rapidly pull wood off of a blank. <coughs> On harder woods, or when you get into knots, so that one, neither of the that that one has one knot right there, but it didn't really affect the carving. It is fine to use wood that has knots in it, especially in larger blocks like this. But you're not going to want to whittle them. You're going to want to take a wrap. This is my favorite style of rasp for wood carving. It's called a Shinto rasp. They're pretty easy to find. They're, you can get them for $20 to $30. They're not real expensive. This is basically a stack of hacksaw blades that has a pair of rivets through them. You do want to make, sh make sure that you don't put twisting motion on it. You can see this one, the rivets pops. It's, it's kind of on its last legs. They don't like to be twisted but you hold them with two hands, use them straight. I'm still using this one even though that rivet popped. It 
very, very efficiently use, removes material. The I do use rasps like this, normal stitched rasp. These machine stitched rasps, they're okay. Not my favorite tool. They are okay. The ones sold for woodworking tend to not have as much hardness in the steel as a metalworking file, and they tend to blunt fairly quickly. You can get really good ones, like Leon J. Rasps, hand-stitched rasps out of Europe. They're expensive. I don't own one, so I cannot review them. All of the rasps that are stitched like this, sold for woodworking, tend to blunt quickly. You can use a farrier's rasp. They last forever, but they are extremely aggressive. And that may or may not be a problem. If I have one of these and I get a big old knot sticking out the side of it, I just grab a farrier's rasp and knock it out of the knock it out of here really quickly. So rasps are the next one. The other place I use a lot of those is when I'm doing a hardwood. So this little loon is a pattern for metal casting, and because of that, I wanted to make it out of a hard wood, so it will be durable. There's more rasp work than whittling work in this carving, because it's a harder wood. When you're done wasting wood with the rasp, I like to go to a coarse file before I go to sandpaper. I like to use these as an intermediate step. This is just a common, you can get these at yard sales all the time, you can get them on internet auctions very in large lots, very inexpensively. But this is a metalworking file, this is a double cut coarse bastard file, and these teeth last forever on wood because again, it is hardened for metalworking, and it's a very nice intermediate step between rasp work and sandpaper. You'll save a lot of time. If you take the deep gouges out with a file before you try to sand them out. So a metalworking file comes in. Layout. You will be doing layout, you'll be measuring things, have some good layout tools. You'll need some sort of square. You can go to a drawing section in any big box store and find a little drawing triangle that will work nicely for getting you started. I have even taken a piece of typing paper and used it, as, it, used it as a square. Not the greatest, but you can get by in a pinch. And you're going to be whittling and carving this to a non-square form, so all you need your square to do is get you good enough to cut out the blank. And you can do that with just about anything that has a nice 90 degree on it. Okay. Um, some carving that I do has multiple pieces laminated together to make the block, like this be with the canoe model. You can see right here, this, this, and this are one piece which was laminated to another. That is part of the process of making these scale half-hole models. That's an intrinsic part of the process. That's where having a plane comes in. Also flattening the back of them after you lay it out. Plane can be very handy. It's thought of more as a carpenter's tool, but it can be very handy now and then in, in carving. Don't go out and buy an expensive plane. This was uh, a yard sale plane. It was very inexpensive. It's a very good plane, but it was a very inexpensive one. These come when they come. Good deals come when they come. You can't predict them or expect them, but you can go to a hardware store and buy a small block plane, and it will do everything that you need to do in carving. You don't need a fancy carpentry plane. So those are useful in specific circumstances, but not all the time. Doing laminated work like this, you will want some clamps. For this sort of light work, you're not going to be gluing up a large tabletop as part of a carving project. Light work, I like these little, um, I call them squeezy clamps. Just squeeze them together. It's nice. You can hold things with one hand and squeeze with the other. They work nice for this sort of crafty stuff. So if you get to doing that sort of work here. Adhesives. I use this expanding foam Gorilla Glue to glue the, the heads on my ducks. I use Elmer's or wood glue, depending on the circumstances, for this sort of laminated work. 
patching or sticking things together, or putting on little fiddly pieces, super glue, I use that in carving. Uh, basically every kind of glue that there is. This guy is assembled with epoxy, epoxy putty, so that I can fill the gaps a little bit in these mating surfaces. A diversity of glues. There's very few glues that I have never used. They all have their place. They all have their purpose. Again, if you're just getting started, you probably won't need glue right out of the way. Pick a simple project, like a little ornament, where you don't need any assembly, and then worry about what adhesives you need when you're doing a more complicated project. Okay. Chisels. Some people will talk about carving and beginner's carving and how to carve, and the first thing they'll do is open up a big tool roll of gouges. Those are handy and crucial if you're doing a lot of relief carving. I don't do a lot of relief carving. I do this round work. So I don't have a lot. The chisel I use more than any is Mr. Inexpensive bought at the hardware store straight chisel. Where I use these is for chopping these mortises. Okay, That's where I use it. You don't need an expensive chisel. You will need to hone these. So just do that. No, I have yet to buy a carving tool that I thought was sharp enough right out, right out of the box. And when you're carving, you're going to be resharpening or at least rehoning, rehoning more than resharpening. But you're going to be honing your tools every half hour. So you've got to get good at sharpening. We'll talk about that here at the end. So these usually come a little bit more on the blunt side. And some people complain about that, but I don't care. You've got to sharpen your tools. Don't expect any tool to be sharp enough right out of the box. So just get an inexpensive chisel. I use... Uh, this three quarter most often. I also have a one eighth out in the wood shop that I'll use when I need to get into a little corner. There are a couple of specialty chisels that I that I have and like. This is a Japanese style crank neck chisel. This is a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful tool. This is a paring chisel. I keep this in the house with my carving tools. Where I use this is for cleaning out the bottoms of these mortises because you can get right in there and you can keep your your hands clear, and I can get all the way into the back. Whereas with this one, right there, I'm starting to run out of room. Okay? So I really like this for that purpose. I also you have this very, very large chisel. This is a two inch firmer chisel. Okay? I have it handled and I use this as you would use a slick. A, this is a paring chisel, not a chopping chisel. So this is very nice for making a very nice line in things. A nice long line uh, to serve as a stopping cut for some other purpose. You can get two hands on this. You can get in. You can r work it around. You can also get a very good grip and pair on something that's held in place. So I do use this for carvings, mostly for the ducks. This, you, you won't use that on something this size, obviously. But I do use this in my carving work. Again, it's a specialty tool. Don't think you need to go out and buy one of these. Wait for it to show up at a yard sale, or get it when you have a need. That's really the only thing that you can use. There's nothing I do with this that I can't also do with this. This is handier and will make a cleaner line in some circumstances, but there's nothing I do with this that I can't do with this. So useful if it shows up at a yard sale or if you really want to start building out a nice toolkit. Not essential. Don't worry about it at the beginning. Okay. That brings us to the two tools that I use more than any other. These do the overwhelming majority of the work on every carving. This is a Sloyd style carving knife. This is a Northern European style used in many areas, sold by many makers. This one is a Frost, is the brand. It is not the only brand. The other, it is a very common brand. They make a very good knife and it's very inexpensive. Uh, the steel is on this knife is second to none even though it's an inexpensive uh, brand. The other brand that makes a very good knife that is also fairly inexpensive is uh, Mora, Mora Knives. 
are very well respected, very good. You can get these little knives for scales 20, 30 bucks. So get one. This should be the first tool, other than a saw, just to mark out your blank, make your blanks the right size. This is the first tool you should get. Get one with a blade shorter than your index finger. You want to be able to hold this comfortably in your palm and reach out and touch the tip with a little bit of curve and control. Okay. You are carving a small object with control and precision. You're not fighting dragons. Okay. This is a tool. This is not a weapon. Don't get a big knife. When I bought this, I bought two of them. This one and one that was about an inch and a half longer. The one that's an inch and a half longer, I chucked in a drawer. And I think I used it twice for skinning deer. I have never used it in a carving. Uh, I might pull it out and do some things. There have been a couple things where I want a little bit more reach than this, but I have other tools to do that. So get a nice Sloyd knife with a short blade. Use your index finger as a gauge. Okay? There's no right size for this, but you should be able to hold it comfortably in your hand, reach out with your index finger, have a little bit of curve in your index finger, and touch the tip. Okay? That's the right size for you. We're all different, so the right size for me isn't necessarily the right size for you. And then the next one, these are usually called, you know, marketed as chip carving tools. The more technical name is a hawksbill knife. In terms of general style, you can see why it kind of looks like a raptor's bill coming down. This, this is the general carving whittling knife. This is for making straight down incisions in your work. Okay, so I'll give you an example where I do that. So this is a carving in progress. And you see at various places, you know, along here, along here, cutting in around the arm, that there's a straight down cut. This is what I do that with. You don't want to try and cut all the way around all at once. You want to go down about an eighth inch at a time make your incision with this knife and then come in and cut to that with this knife. You can split off that chunk. Okay. So this in combination with this represents probably a healthy 90% of the time invested in any carbon with these two tools. Okay. So start here and your saw. Then buy your draw knife. Okay? And then other things happen as they happen. If you're doing a lot of curved work, uh, convex, or sorry, concave curved work specifically, you'll want a tool that lets you cut a nice concave surface. Okay? That's where this, these come in. This is a European uh, spoon knife. Okay? And this. You, you whittle with it just like you would with that one, but since it's got this nice curve, you can cut a concavity into your work. Okay? And this is how I do these concavities marking out the, the wing pad on these duck decoys. Useful for spoons, useful for wooden cups, useful for all these sorts of things. This is the European style. This is a crooked knife. This is the indigenous North American style. The Native American name for it is a Makatagan. These are not commercially available. I made this one. We're going to talk about these at length here in the near future. If you want one of these, you got to know a blacksmith. But these are handled, it's used differently. All European knives, you hold palm down and work like this. Okay. The Makatagan, the crooked knife, you use palm up. Hold it in your hand here, palm up. Now notice when my hand is in this nice neutral position, the blade is perpendicular to whatever workpiece I'm holding in my other hand. Okay. This does the job of the draw knife 
and the hook knife. So it's two tools in one. I love this design. It is one of the most amazing ergonomic designs ever. And again, I can do an incised concavity using the tip. Or I could say, oh, there's a little bit of irregularity here. I need to shave that down. I can use this like a one-handed draw shave. Two tools in one. Very nice thing. But again, you're not going to find this unless you know a blacksmith. This one is not entirely finished. It'll get a wrap on the handle. So these are special purpose. If you want to jump right into spoon carving or something like that, then this one, this is also made by Frost. Uh, this is another tool that should be on your buy sooner, not later list. If you're going to do convex work exclusively, punt on this, you're not going to need it for a while. Okay. And then other tools you use once in a while. So things that are assembled again, thumbs you need to make holes. Attaching the eyes, drill bit. These uh, ducks, all the head is pegged on, drill bit. I brought one of my nice brace and bits out. I love brace and bits. I use these preferentially over, I do have cordless drills. I use these preferentially in carving work because I, I feel I have more control with the hand tool than with the power tool, but if you have a power drill, don't think that you need to buy go go run out and buy one of these. You can just use the power drill as well. But there are instances in carving where you'll need to peg something or you'll need to put an eye on a duck or some such thing. So drills are on the table for carving tools. Okay, that's the basics. The last thing is sharpening. You're going to need to get friendly with sharpening stones. Like I said, you want to hone and polish your edge about every half hour of carving work. If you're doing maple more often, if you're doing wood with a lot of silica in it, like anything in the, the genus Caria, the hickories and pecans, then you're going to need to sharpen a lot more often than that. If you're working with something that has bark on it, like if you're draw knifing through bark, Bark has almost always got some grit in it. You're going to be sharpening more often. So you're going to need a good sharpening set. I only brought one stone out. I, I have a bunch of stones. To get started, what I recommend you do is buy tools that don't need fully resharpened. This is an antique. When I bought this, it had huge chips out of the blade. So I spent the better part of half a day on a sandstone, water stone, I guess it's around 60 or 80 grit, somewhere in that neighborhood, and I spent a half a day reshaping this edge. Okay? That's fine when you're experienced at sharpening tools. When you're new, don't do that. Go get a tool, get a new tool that has an edge which is only going to need a little bit of mild honing. And then go and get a stone which is a medium and fine combination of two stones glued together. You can get these from kitchen supply stores. You can get these from woodworking supply. Get something that's got something on the order of uh, um, words. Uh, about 800 grit, 600 to 800 grit on one side and 1200 grit on the other. Get that for your coarse horning and then get a polishing stone in the neighborhood of 6,000 or 8,000 grit for polishing. All of your tools, if you look at these tools, they are shiny wherever they touch the wood. Some tools like the Japanese chisel are deliberately ch uh, designed so that they have a hollow in the back so that you don't have to hone the entire surface. But all of the surface where it meets the wood is shiny. You want your tools to leave a burnished finish, not a rough finish. So after you shape, you polish, and then when you're touching them up, you can just go to the polishing stone or to a strop and polish that micro bevel. I'll do a video just on sharpening at some point along the line here, but again, sharpening tools should be on your short list. 
So these two are on the short list, your sharpening tools and a saw. And then add the rest as you need them. I pulled it, almost everything out that I use to put it in context, but again, you don't need everything on the table just to get started. So I hope this helps. I'm going to do some videos here in the very near, fu near future on some beginner's carving projects such as our Christmas goose and some things on sharpening, some of the other details. So I hope you will like, share, and subscribe and ring the notification bell so that you see when those come out. And I will see you later. Have a wonderful evening all.